The text before the lesson is Revelation 3, verses 14 through 19. Revelation 3, 14 through 19. These are God's words. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous to repent. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Amen. Please be seated. This afternoon, we begin a series of lessons on the subject of shame. This particular series will alternate with the other series I started the last time I was preaching. That series is called The Beginning, which, is, uh, which covers the opening chapters of Genesis. So these two series will run concurrently and roughly will alternate from Sunday to Sunday. That will either make it so that you don't get sick of either of the two series or that you will get sick of both of them at the same time. So we'll see how that goes. Today we begin our study of shame with what philosophers call a rough and ready definition, a working definition. And that's because the concept of shame in scripture is fairly complex. We could likely spend the entire series parsing the lexical nuances of the various terms involved, and I know you would love to do that, but instead what we will do is make a few important distinctions that will then lead us to a simple but sufficient definition. Now perhaps the least controversial thing to say about shame, there's many controversial things to say, but perhaps the least controversial thing to say about it is that it's an emotion, which means that shame is a response, a physical response to some precipitating event. Indeed, it's a negative response to this event. It's a negative emotion. We might even say it's a painful awareness that one has fallen short of some standard or ideal. In fact, that will be sort of our, our base definition, that shame is a painful awareness that you have fallen short of a standard or ideal. Now, one important distinction to make concerning that definition is to differentiate shame from guilt, because those two words are often used interchangeably. The difference between them, it seems to me, is that guilt is not in and of itself an emotion. Rather, it is what we might call a socio-legal condition. It's an objective description of our legal or social standing within a particular community. So to say that I'm guilty is to say that I've committed some offense against the community. I've fallen short in some way of its standards. And when it comes to sin in the most general sense, of course, this is true of all of us, for we have all fallen short of the glory of God, as Paul says in Romans 3, the glory of God being the ultimate standard. What we could also refer to as the law of the kingdom. God's law, his written prescriptive law, is a manifestation, one manifestation of his glory, of his uh, perfect nature. So it, when it comes to that standard, every one of us uh, stand before God guilty, and that's what the cross ultimately uh, satisfies is the justice uh, of God when it comes to that 
guilt. So to feel guilty then, that is to be guilty, to feel guilty is to experience the emotions of one who is guilty. And these feelings include more than just shame. Shame is one of those feelings, but also one experiences sadness and fear when they are guilty. They experience regret, remorse, and perhaps the best place in scripture to go to get a sense of, of that mix of emotions that you have when you are guilty is, of course, Psalm 51, which is Paul's, uh, Paul, which is David's, uh, we're going to talk about Paul in just a minute, which is David's psalm of lament when it comes to his sin with Bathsheba. And in it, he well expresses all of these various emotions that come when someone is guilty. He speaks about God hiding his face from his sins and blotting out his iniquities and, and calling on God to deliver him from this blood guiltiness and to create in him a new heart. And so he uses beautiful verse to express these various emotions. So shame is one of those emotions that are experienced when one is guilty, when they fall short of the standard. And in particular, it's the feeling of humiliation, of disgrace, or an older word is mortification, right? You might have heard someone say, the older people, older people like me say, I'm mortified by what has happened. The word sort of means dead, so it's kind of like you're dying of embarrassment, right? You want to crawl up in a hole and sort of just disappear. So it's this notion of humiliation and disgrace. Now, a second distinction that's important to note is between the experience of feeling shame that we discussed and the act of shaming. The first is, as we said, the subjective feeling associated with guilt. And of course, there are numerous examples of this in Scripture. The most notorious, no doubt, is the one that was read to us in the beginning of Genesis, in Genesis 3, which describes the fall of Adam and Eve, that upon eating the forbidden fruit, as we read, their eyes were open, the text says, and they realized that they were naked and they were filled with shame and then they hide themselves not only from one another, but then from their creator. Now in this passage, we're going to come back to this passage because there's a lot of interesting symbolism that's there concerning nakedness and sh associating shame with nakedness and the covering of nakedness, um, and this desire, which is interesting to hide. As I said, it, when you feel shame, you sort of want to crawl up in a little hole and die. You want to sort of disappear, um, which is an interesting um, uh, a sense to have when it comes to guilt. So we're going to explore that symbolism in those connections in a future lesson. But the point is, is that that's the emotion, right? The act of shame, though, is what an individual or group does to bring about that experience of shame, whether it be in an individual or in a group. It's a form of discipline that also plays a prominent role in scripture. The Apostle Paul, in particular, actively shames uh, his brethren when he writes to them in an effort to not only regulate this community of Christians, but also to conform them to the image of Christ. Again and again, particularly in his letter to the Corinthians, which is not a, not a surprise, if you know that letter, but he says things like, I say this to your shame. So Paul clearly engages in this act of shaming, and of course, throughout scripture, uh, maybe even most um, specifically in the Old Testament, we see that God uses and his apostles and prophets use this act of shaming in order to conform people to his image. Okay, so that gives us a working definition that we will use throughout our study. What I want to do now is to talk about why this study is necessary. Why do we have to have this kind of study? Why am I going to dedicate numerous lessons to this particular subject? Well. 
in one, in, for one reason, one reason this is necessary is because of the profound confusion of our age concerning the nature and purpose of shame. Because on the one hand, many find the concept of shame shameful. They see it as a primitive tool of character development, a remnant of a more repressive age, and it's one they think was employed primarily as a means of psychological control rather than as a path to human freedom and flourishing. Many think of it as a kind of precursor to guilt, which is also viewed as counterproductive to psychological development today. And what underlies that antipathy to, to um, shame is the belief that a healthy self-esteem is the key to emotional peace and prosperity. And therefore, negative forms of discipline like shame and humiliation and guilt must be replaced with more pro positive practices like encouragement and affirmation and self-acceptance. You might even say that advocacy, according to this understanding, is what produces the harvest of righteousness and peace, not discipline, as what Paul says. Which is to say that cultivation of virtue today is about sort of this boundless endorsement and not a real strict kind of correction. It's about being an advocate, not a tutor. And unfortunately, this societal hostility toward shame has shaped the consciences of many Christians, maybe at least to some extent, the majority of Christians. And this is why churches fill their pulpits with pleasantries and not reproachments, and why all one seems to receive in many corporate worship um, in, you know, times of worship is encouragement and affirmation, which of course is righteous and holy and good, but so is rebuke and admonition, which they often or perhaps never receive. And the reason for this imbalance, as T. Lee Lau points out in his um, monograph on this subject, which I will reference quite a bit through our study, the reason for the imbalance um, according to Lao, is that churches are no longer promoting, and I'm quoting him here, a religion of sin, righteousness, justice, holiness, and repentance, but rather one of feeling good and inner peace. The language of remorse, rebuke, shame, discipleship, and the cross have been replaced with the feckless language of happiness and niceness, close quote. Meaning that the congregation, more and more this is true, they, it's no longer viewed as a growing body of believers who are in need of rigorous discipline, but as a nursery of perpetual infants who are in need of a weekly diaper change. Now, one sign of this shift in mindset, and I wonder if you've noticed this, I've noticed this in the last few years, is the incorporation of therapeutic language in preaching. Sermons that are saturated, as Brad East points out, in the talk of wellness and health and toxicity and self-care and harm and safety and you know we have to be balanced, uh, affirmation or holding space or being well-adjusted and on and on it goes. Very therapeutic language has begun to dominate biblical teaching. Now, it's not that Scripture rejects the language of healing and restoration. In fact, it uses it very often, but always it, it always uses it in the context of sin and redemption, meaning that Jesus came to heal, yes, but he came to heal sinners. And it's a healing that requires complete humiliation, a death to yourself in order to take place. Now, I want to spend the, the rest of our time talking about some of the consequences of this triumph of the therapeutic, this, this 
this sort of zeitgeist that, is, that has taken over uh, much of the evangelical church because it seems to me that the consequences are legion and it's not just affecting the church but then of course it's being spread in the church and then it's going out and affecting all the other ministries and families and the rest. Now there are many consequences but I'm going to mention a few of the ones that I think are uh, most important. Firstly, as Gregory Jones has warned, by adopting a therapeutic framework, the church is in danger of distorting forgiveness by turning it into a self-help process. How many times have some, has someone said to you that you know, when, you, when you're going to forgive someone, don't forgive the person for their sake, right? Forgive the person for your sake. The emphasis more and more seems to be upon that. And they say that because it can provide you a psychological relief, right? As you just let go and say, okay, well, I'm just gonna let that go and I'm not gonna carry it around. The problem with this, as Jones points out, especially if we're just doing that in isolation, is that we are no longer trying to discern whether there are perhaps tragic misunderstandings that, has, that have led to this uh, divide or culpable wrongdoing and brokenness that's at the heart of it, things that need to be dealt with through practices of forgiveness and repentance. In other words, rather than working things out the hard way, rather than confronting sin and wrestling through to genuine reconciliation, which is the goal, and, and I say that in the sense of working at it as much as depends on us is what scripture says, right? Because sometimes we work at that and the person that, that we're trying to reconcile ourselves to wants nothing to do with it. They want nothing to do with us. And so scripture exhorts as well, as much as depends on you, seek this reconciliation. But that means as much as depends on you. You need to be going through this process and seeking reconciliation. But rather than doing that, what seems to be happening more and more is that people are using this sort of self-interested forgiveness as just a shortcut, shortcut to peace, right? Where they're saying, well, instead of getting involved in all of that, right, and, and, and really digging in with this person and trying to work it out so that we can get to reconciliation, so that we can experience true peace in our relationship. Rather than that, it's just easier to take this shortcut and say, well, I'm just going to let it go and enjoy my own inner peace. In other words, peace is not in sort of a, fo a false peace because peace is not just the absence of conflict, but rather it comes from genuine reconciliation, which takes a lot of work and a lot of give and take. And so I, it seems to me one danger of this therapeutic mindset that I, I myself have seen is this idea that it distorts the notion of forgiveness. Therapeutic preaching also tends to treat the symptoms rather than the disease, which makes one feel good when he leaves the sanctuary, having received a soothing balm for his aches and pains, but it fails to address the underlying issue, which is idolatry, and therefore no true healing takes place. So many Christians today, I fear, never receive the balm of Gilead, as, as Scripture speaks of this salve for their eyes that will allow them to see the truth, as Jesus uh, speaks to the church at Laodicea, as we read, which is a restoration, he says, that comes only through reproof and discipline. I'm afraid so many in the church today never experience that. They never experience you know, the joy and peace and, and strength that comes from being rebuked, from being reproved, and turning from sin and you know truly repenting of it and then the times of refreshing come those times of refreshing are what energize you and drive you in your Christian walk I'm afraid that for so many Christians that's getting cut short we're jumping right to just to the affirmation and the the, the sort of adoration another thing that the turn to the therapeutic has done is it's it's really prevented churches from practicing formal discipline. Here's a way to think about it. If you're in a church of 300 people or more, you could probably say 150 people or more at least, 
But if you're in a church of, let's say, 300 people or more, and the elders have never publicly withdrawn from anyone the whole time you were there, it's safe to say that the church, the church discipline is not being practiced in that church. And this is actually kind of amazing because one of the true marks of a Reformed church for a long time in church history, from the time of Reformation down, is that it practices church discipline. In our Protestant movement, church discipline has been one of the features of Reformed churches. And I, I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't seen data on it, but my guess would be is the vast majority of churches do not practice church discipline, in part because of the rise of the therapeutic. In other words, the reason they're not practicing it is because the elders know how such public humiliation is going to be received by the congregation. The congregation has been shaped in this way to have an aversion to shame, and so they're not going to engage in that with the potential of losing their congregants. But here's the thing, it's not just churches that have been infected by this aversion to shame. In the 15 years that I spent in Christian education, it was a given that even among parents who affirmed the rightness of public shaming in principle, and those were few, by the way, but even among those who understood from Scripture that public shaming was right, and they affirmed it in principle, they would vehemently oppose it being applied to their child in practice. For example, it was a school policy we had that if a student was caught cheating on an exam, he was required to confess his transgression to his classmates and to entreat their forgiveness. In other words, he was told that you have to seek real reconciliation, that you are now in debt. You've done a wrong to this class. You are in debt to them, a spiritual debt, and you have to go and ask for forgiveness so that you can be let out of that debt, so that you can truly reconcile with uh, your fellow Christians, your fellow students. But the thought of one's child being publicly humiliated in this way was very often too much for a parent to bear. And they would rush to their child's defense. Now, just as an aside, for those of you who are parents, those of you who are going to hopefully be parents, your primary responsibility as a parent is not to be your child's advocate. That's more therapeutic language, right? Your primary responsibility is not to defend your child, but to discipline them. And if another adult cares enough to do it in your absence, all the better. You should bless that person and thank them and appreciate them. But parents today are more zealous to protect their child's self-esteem than their holiness. And they are then shocked when the foolishness that's bound up in their heart reaps a whirlwind. And here's the thing, administrators know this. And so many of them not wanting to deal with, as they call the lawnmower parents, right? Where they just plow down every obstacle in the path of their children, preparing the path for the children rather than children for the path. Not wanting to deal with those people, they just abandon public shaming altogether. And then they justified in their minds with pop psychology. So even in the, in the best of Christian schools, my sense is, even in those that are the most strict, they are having to deal with this therapeutic influence, this aversion to shaming, and it's going to have a dramatic effect upon the behavior of the students, upon their uh, spiritual development. A final consequence of the loss of shame concerns society itself. In a future lesson, we'll discuss the necessity of shame for spiritual formation and how that works. But it's also important to consider the profound effect it has on bringing order to society more generally. Indeed, apart from the regulating principle of shame, peace can only come through the sword which is to say, essentially, through authoritarianism, a truth that was understood by everyone up until 15 minutes ago. 
Philosopher Roger Scruton helpfully reminds us of this fact when he writes the following. In almost all matters that touched upon the core requirements of social order, our predecessors, and there he means 18th century and early 19th century Westerners, our predecessors believed that the genial pressure of manners, morals, and customs enforced by the various forms of disapproval, stigma, shame, and reproach, was a more powerful guarantor of civilized and lawful behavior than the laws themselves. Inner sanctions, they argued, more dependably maintain society than such external ones as policemen and courts. Apart from self-government governance, the laws must be expanded and made more complex in order to fill the void. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.9, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. So there's a trade-off that while with self-governance one can have both peace and freedom, Apart from it, peace can only come through greater external control. A control, as Scruton says, which is more, a more effete guarantor of lawful behavior. It's weaker in controlling behavior because it's external, not internal. And what this means, and I think this is, this is incredibly important, what this means is that moral order in a civil society is meant to be kept in check by societal disapproval, by stigma, by shame and reproach. All concepts that strike us as mean and cruel, as uncivilized. But if you think that shaming is boorish, Wait until wickedness is so rampant that it can only be controlled with a baton to the head. Such things are worthy of our consideration, especially as we begin this month, the month of June, the time when the most depraved among us glory in their shame, which civilized society has permitted with greater and greater regularity. Now, one of the ways that our family has resisted this deluge of degeneracy is by attempting to reintroduce the stigma of these abominable acts, or at least to do so in our own neighborhood. Now, one way that we do this is in the form of provocative yard signs, of course, right? The art sign. I say they're provocative, but they're, they simply convey biblical teaching. But they are provocative in our day and age. And they draw the ire, not just of wanton sinners, but worried Christians who are troubled by our immodest approach, expressing concern that our signs are inflammatory and ineffectual. Someday in the future, we have to dig deeper into this language of concern that is so common today, especially among people in your own tribe. For us, this would be Christians, and how it can be used rhetorically as a form of manipulation, right? Where they're not coming to you in good faith, you know, asking questions which always should be received, should be received with eagerness, but what they're really trying to do is shame you into silence to stop what you're doing. But anyway, let me address the two objections that we get every single time from Christians, which is that it's, we're being inflammatory and that what we're doing is ineffectual. First, ineffectual. The thing to say about that is God's word is never ineffectual, never. If you proclaim his word, if you preach the gospel, it will pierce the listener. It never comes back void, never, Scripture says. Paul describes God's word as sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow. It is the sword of the spirit, God's word is. And it is powerful. It will pierce deep into your soul. So it is never ineffectual to put God's word on a sign. Secondly, when I'm told that my words are inflammatory, I wonder to myself whether the person making the charge has ever read the Bible, to be honest. Have they not read the, con the, the condemnations of Jesus that it would be better for a millstone to be tied around one's neck and to be cast into the depths of the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble? Or what he said to the scribes and Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. And what about the Apostle Paul, who says of his own kinsmen, who are trying to force circumcision upon Gentile converts, that he wished that they would castrate themselves instead? And this is to say nothing of Stephen's 53 verse invective against his fellow Jews, or the plethora of prophetic castigations in the Old Testament, and on and on we could go. Here's what I wonder. Have we forgotten the shock and awe of Scripture? Or is it that we are embarrassed by it? Which of those two is more likely? The real problem, I think, is that our more genteel brethren view such public pushback as uncivilized, as uncouth, as vulgar, when in fact it is the opposite. Stigma, shame, and reproach are how a civilized society deals with depravity. It is how it undermines its influence, how it pushes it to the fringe. If a society refuses such social restraints, all that will be left to you is violence. All of this to say that when it comes to the zeitgeist of our age, the spirit of our age, shame has become a taboo. And yet, shame can't be a taboo forever, right? Because at the same time, a new spirit is emerging and gaining ascendancy, which has rediscovered the utility of shame. A cancel culture ethos, which thrives, in fact, on its power. Where the shaming is punitive without being redemptive, where it is consumed by justice at the neglect of mercy, and where every sin is a sin against the community, where each member is allowed to exact his pound of flesh. This is an oppressive form of shame that is driven by resentment and which only provokes the same in its recipients. And thus you see the great incoherence of our age concerning the concept of shame, where it is either a taboo or an effective tool of tyranny. And so the purpose of this study is to reintroduce the biblical understanding of shame. And I think, I myself have been shocked by the study. I think that some of you will be shocked by what scripture has to say about shame. And I know that Christians as a whole would be shocked by it. The point is to defend its goodness from its fashionable critics by noting the prominent role that it plays in spiritual and societal formation but also to distinguish it from those forms of discipline that really are oppressive. And so the working title of the series, I would make a terrible Baptist preacher. Or you all know that, right? I can't, you know, the alliterations and all that. I, can't, I can never even come up with a title. I always have a working title for this series. The working title is Make Stigma Great Again. <laughs> 